The European Union moves in mysterious ways, or perhaps not so mysterious. In the end, well, it was a good old-fashioned Franco-German compromise that broke the deadlock on top jobs for the incoming five-year session. The presidency of the European Commission going to Angela Merkel's own defense minister, the head of the European Central Bank, to the French boss at the International Monetary Fund, and the rest, well, a delicate political balancing act between nations and political blocs. We'll be asking our panel about Ursula von der Leyen, uh, seen here alongside uh, initial German pick Manfred Weber, and Christine Lagarde. We'll also ask about the workings of the EU, a political project that, let's remember, answers to citizens in a transnational parliament, as well as to 28 individual heads of state. Emmanuel Macron led the charge against the German-backed principle of the Spitzenkandidaten, lead candidates like Weber, that represent the voting blocs that get the most seats in EU elections after the Brexit vote, with Eurosceptic populists questioning the Commission's right to challenge rule of law violations in Eastern Europe or budget overruns in Italy. How legitimate is the new lineup when it comes to decision making? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering, uh, is it a fair deal that's been worked out uh, in Brussels? Joining us, he's Georgia's former European integration minister, Thornike Gordadze, teaches at the French political science institute Sciences Po. Good evening. Thank you for being with us. Thornike, who uh, surely crosses paths with uh, Thomas Vitiello, who is with Sciences Po's uh, research branch, Sevipov. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, from Brussels, Monica Frassoni, she's co-chair of the European Green Party. Welcome back to the show. Good evening. And uh, Birgit Holzer, correspondent for the German press here in Paris. Hello. Thanks for joining us. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. Uh, reminder of Tuesday night's announcements. So it's Ursula von der Leyen at the commission. Spain's foreign minister, Josep Borrell, to replace Federica Mogherini as EU foreign policy chief. Christine Lagarde takes over from Mario Draghi at the ECB. And Belgian Prime Minister Charles Michel to replace the outgoing Donald Tusk at the European Council. We have chosen two women and two men for the four key positions. A perfect gender balance. I am really happy about it. After all, Europe is a woman. I think it's just for uh, a perfect uh, gender uh, gender balance. He he says, after all, Europe is a woman. Your reaction to those yeah. comments, Birgit? Um, I think it's an interesting sign to have. We had four um, important posts to to give, and two women um, might have them. I think this is even one of the the ver or Christine Lagarde is one of the persons who are fighting the most. Um, for for women uh, in in giving important um, uh, important positions to women, so um, this is one of the first signs you you, you can see. So um, personally, I think this is a good. Uh, um, it's a, uh, it's showing that it's advancing. Um, but uh, we attended a surprise. We had a surprise. Yeah, we had a, we had quite a lot of surprises uh, on this. Thomas Vitel, you, your thoughts on. Uh what came out of the hat on Tuesday evening? Yeah, it is quite a surprise. Uh, but then if we look at the result, to me it looks like a perfect compromise between France and Germany. Um, uh, because uh, the French uh, uh, President Emmanuel Macron wanted to get rid of the Spitzen candidate system and he achieved that. But at the same time he wanted to have a, a French man or woman, in that case a woman, at, at a top job position. And he managed to put Christine Lagarde at the head of the ECB. Uh, but then, uh, to satisfy uh, Germany, uh, Christine Lagarde is a conservative to, to satisfy the, uh, um, the European uh, the PPE uh, party in, in Brussels. And on the other hand, uh, um, well, the Germans who uh, obtain the head of the uh, uh, European Commission, the presidency of the European Commission, it's the first time since 1967, so it's quite an achievement. But at the same time, it's somebody who speaks very well French, who grew up in Brussels, and therefore somebody that Emmanuel Macron felt comfortable with. So here we see the perfect compromise. A, a beautiful sides. compromise if you're French or German, mm -hmm. Monica mm -hmm. Frassoni. Well, you know, I really do not agree with this uh, black and white idea that Europe is done uh, of Franco-German agreement. I think that one has to consider at least three quickly, three elements. 
First, the first, the first agreement was not what was, uh, um, what was concluded. Actually, the first agreement, the so-called Osaka Agreement, uh, had a completely different setting, and that was uh, taken down by the unholy alliance between um, the uh, Visegrad uh, countries and Italians, basically, and also some other countries. But let's say um, it was a political opposition to a candidate like Timmerman, who is coming from the socialists. So I think that that was the first uh, agreement that was there, which would have uh, perfectly um, at least matched with the question of the leading candidate process. Uh, the second point is that uh, this, um, this story is not finished. First, uh, I don't think that uh, we should, we will just say, we will just see a simple yes by the parliament. There will be some wrangling, there will be some discussions. And just to be clear uh, on that point, it's possible it, it, just that, to be clear uh, on that point, it's just the president of the European Commission that has to be ratified by the parliament. Absolutely. It is just the president of the European Commission and, by extension, the high representative, of course. Uh, but not certainly the president of the Council, for which uh, the uh, Council has got, uh, the European Council has got the full um, capacity and powers to decide upon. And as far as the ECB uh, president is concerned, is also a completely different animal, if you want. So I would, I would not say that this is simply and plainly a victory for the Franco-German. It is certainly an example that um, there, there has been a compromise that uh, needed to be, to be concluded. But uh, I would not, and this is well, my third point, say that the uh, Spitzenkandidat, the leading candidate process, is finished. This is uh, absolutely not, uh, not the so case. So are you suggesting... And I believe also that... Uh, are you suggesting that uh, uh, Ursula von der Leyen could be shot down at the, at the, by the parliament? I am not suggesting anything. I'm just saying that uh, the, she didn't get uh, elected by, by the parliament yet. And uh, there are still a couple of weeks. I am not advocating that uh, she should be teared down, even if uh, it is very clear that if I would be a member of parliament as I was, I would definitely, at least today, not vote in favor of her. Um, so I think that the point that I wanted to make is that the, the main weakness of the leading candidate process is that there are no transnational lists. And this is also what President Macron said. Um, so I think that uh, to close the chapter of the leading candidate process is a little bit too hasty. And I am also convinced that had the uh, EPP chosen a stronger candidate, uh, the situation would probably be very different today. Yeah, the EPP, which is that center-right uh, block, still has the biggest number of seats, even though it's got fewer than in the previous legislature, Thornike Gordadze. Uh, but it's got within uh, in that block uh, the Italians, of Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia, and as well uh, the uh, the Hungarians. They're and suspended, but they're still in. Suspended, but still in. And, and there was, as Monica was saying, this push by Italy and Eastern Europe to block the uh, nomination of the Social Democrat Franz Timmermans. It's uh, fascinating about uh, this, this debate about Spitzenkandidat and, candidate and, and why it didn't work. Uh, it didn't work mainly because uh, uh, European Union is not a national state. And uh, uh, the nominations at the end of the uh, electoral process and el elections are much more about uh, discussions, negotiations, uh, political force, f horse trading between the heads of states and governments than the elections. That's why even if the Greens got a very good uh, score in most of the countries of the European Union, they didn't get one of the top jobs because there is no head of government or head of state. Is it undemocratic? Uh, it's it's the ru rules of the European Union. Yeah, I, I, I mean, personally, I'm in favor of transnational transnational lists. But look, when you when you when the when the different parties are selecting their their leader, their Spitzenkandidat, they cannot negotiate in advance uh, uh, with the heads of states which are from different political parties. So the EPP or the Greens or the or the Socialists cannot say that oh my candidate is compatible with the Liberal Macron or my candidate from uh, EPP is compatible with the with the with the Socialists in other uh, like in Spain where the, where the government is, is socialist. So it's impossible 
from the very beginning, it was impossible to uh, to organize or, or very complicated to organize this uh, uh, Spitzenkandidat system in, in, European, in, in European elections. That's why we uh, uh, got this surprising uh, uh, result. But it, it's, it works like this. If you remember uh, last elections in European Union uh, uh, Parliament, uh, usually uh, the candidates come at the end after long negotiations and uh, political horse trading, as I said, and it's very difficult to, to predict from the beginning how, how, what will be the result. If you had transnationalists, and we can see the, uh, the, the makeup of the new parliament coming up on the screen from those May elections, uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas Vitalio, would it still just be the big nations uh, ruling the roost? I think it would be a little bit harder because now we will have, in the case of transnationalists, we will have a, a winner, a party winner with a leader who had won the election that can prevail itself of having, you know, a popular support. Would it be the same know? result as this? We cannot say that. You know, it's too difficult to rerun. You know, it's it's a if it's it's a fiction. It would be a fictional scenario. We could not know. But even in the case of the same scenario, we will have a leader, a winner with a political legitimacy of voters all around the European Union. And therefore, it is. It would be somebody who could sit on the table of negotiation, saying, "This is what. This is my weight across European Union." And that's what uh, the President Emmanuel Macron said. That in the case of transnational lists, he would have not uh, intervened as much in, in a process. All right. Uh, in any case, there is a, a potential winner for now. She's a mother of seven, who learned French growing up in Brussels. Ursula von der Leyen ticks a lot of boxes, and if Parliament approves her. She'll find herself at 60, taking the reins from Jean-Claude Juncker as the head of the EU executive. Charlie James has more. Europe is needed. Europe has to speak with one voice. Germany's Ursula von der Leyen has been a passionate supporter of the European Union. Now she could take over the bloc's top job. If EU Parliament confirms von der Leyen as European Commission chief, she will be the first woman to ever hold the post. But blazing that trail isn't new to von der Leyen. The 60-year-old conservative politician is currently Germany's first female defense minister. Born in Brussels, von der Leyen comes from a political family. Her father was a prominent German state premier. But she didn't enter politics until the age of 42, after first building a career in medicine. She became a minister in the regional state government of Lower Saxony before spending the past 14 years as a cabinet minister. Her tenure as German defense minister hasn't been smooth, marked by international crises, scandals and criticism. But she is also considered a close ally of Chancellor Angela Merkel. Ursula von der Leyen has earned so much trust among other leaders for all sorts of different reasons. Von der Leyen speaks fluent English and French and has lived in Britain and the United States. If she heads to Brussels as head of the EU's executive arm, she will oversee a broad range of decisions for the bloc, from law proposals on everything from migration to climate, to negotiating trade deals, to policing member states' budgets. And it was interesting, uh, Birgit Holzer, because when uh, the news was breaking Tuesday, it was the Germans who seemed to have some, some of them having second thoughts, many associating her with the overspending of the German military, as we heard in that report, and Sears possibly being kicked upstairs. Merkel abstained during the vote to soothe uh, uh, the uh, Social Democratic coalition partners of hers uh, who are seething over... Uh, uh, Franz Timmermans, that Dutch EU parliament Spitzenkandidat, uh, being sidelined. And there was this ferocious uh, tweet that came uh, from the former head of the Social Democrats, uh, Martin Schulz, uh, who uh, said, Van der Leyen is our, is our weakest minister. That's apparently enough to become commission president. It's a bad sign. She's one of the less popular ministers at the moment because uh, she had a lot of scandals and she didn't real, really show um, a good work or she doesn't have really have good results. Um, some years ago, she was discussed as uh, potential for, for succeeding to Angela Merkel and finally she didn't convince. So, um, yeah, it's hard to explain why she was chosen. Yes, she's a, she's a woman. She's uh, close to Angela Merkel. Um, if I was being cynical, would I say she was chosen... Because she's somebody who's not going to outshine the uh, the heads of state and the 
prime ministers. Yes, it's still the the same image that's that's shown that the leaders, the politi political leaders, don't want really to give power to, um, to 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 the president of the commission. Maybe, yeah. So, um, is uh, it a fair cop, or can she surprise us? Ah, uh, maybe she she's going to, going to surprise. But I think she, in Germany she's known for showing off in a way. But um, she doesn't have the results. So I think this is a danger. Tonika Gordadze, you agree? Yeah, I think she was also chosen. It was uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, proposal at the end. Uh, uh, because, uh, this is what Macron the French press says. Yeah, and this is more or less true, I think, because uh, Macron was very skillful in, um, in these negotiations. He was against, from the very beginning, against Weber. And uh, he proposed someone that the Germans could not refuse. So she's German, she's from from the CDU, uh, and she's much less uh, um, uh, conservative than Weber, so she's compatible with the liberals and maybe also with the center-left. So it was also the the French uh, the president that showed his uh, skills. And the, uh, again about the, the, the results, and uh, um, uh, we have also the Belgian prime minister who is appointed as the, as the head of the, of the council. Uh, he had good results, but at the end he lost elections in Belgium, the 26th of May, uh, the the uh, he's a lame duck they, prime minister yeah. now. So he uh, he he was prime minister for three or four years in Belgium. He he showed good results, but he was not uh, compensated by uh, by by the electorate by in Belgium. She lost elections. Monica Frassoni, who would you have liked to have seen as president of the European Commission? You see, I I am very. I can tell you a couple of names, but I don't think that this will serve any purpose since a chosen person is a different one. The main problem I see with, uh, with the chosen candidate is that uh, she represents the complete status quo and was present in a government, in the German government, which was, um, since the very beginning, which was uh, the, the government which pushed very much not only the so-called austerity, but also this idea of the European Union as a guardian, basically, of public deficits, and that's it. And uh, um, I believe that uh, this, uh, this representative of, uh, uh, of an idea of Europe that probably is certainly more integrated, but is basically a little bit more of what uh, has been done till now, is, is really what we, what we don't need. Um, we don't have any kind of interest or credentials from her side on the biggest risk uh, for our planet, which is of, and our continent, which is, of course, climate change. And um, in terms of her knowledge of how the European Union works, uh, I'm also very worried because, you see, most of, uh, of the commissioners are ministers. And uh, this has proven to be a real problem because the only reference they have is really the Council. And this uh, was true for Juncker, this was true for Barroso, um, and this has been one of the reasons why the Commission has been transforming itself little by little in a sort of council secretariat. This is certainly not the personality that we need uh, today for political, but also for institutional, uh, for institutional reason. Also, the fact that she was just taken out the hat like that um, means that uh, um, she uh, probably does not have a European vision that could be adapted to what the challenges are. All right, we're going to uh, we're going to pick up on that uh, point. Makes me we particularly worried. Makes you worried. We're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. The dust settling on. Uh, the uh, nomination of the top jobs at the European Union for the next five years. We're talking about it with uh, Georgia's former European Integration Minister, Thornika Gordadze, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, Sciences Po, whose research arm, Sevipov, includes Thomas Vitiello. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back as well to Birgit Holzer, correspondent here in Paris for uh, the German press. And uh, from Brussels, Monica Frassoni, who is uh, the co-chair of uh, the European uh, Green Party. Uh, before the break, uh, Monica, you were uh, t talking to us uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, the way in which those jobs are meted out, uh, accusing uh, the European Commission of becoming a glorified secretariat uh, for the EU leaders, for the, for the EU Council. Let me ask you, uh, because the Greens have been left out, right, uh, of the, these top jobs, even though you surged 
in the uh, European elections and you're a, a pro-EU party. Uh, what kind of posts at the commission should the Greens get? Well, you see, uh, the nomination of the, of the commissioners uh, is uh, done uh, by, according to the rules, by the national government. Uh, in the past, uh, you probably remember that uh, every country, above all the big ones, had two commissioners, but this is no more the case. So it is only obvious that the different parties, the different governments will choose a commissioner um, that will be near to them. Um, the exception is indeed uh, the, the thanks to the leading candidate process because Timmerman is socialist and the government in the Netherlands is not socialist and uh, Madame Vestager is, uh, is also not coming directly from a government uh, um, expression, directly expression from a government. So I think that the leading candidate process did serve uh, some purpose, but this we can discuss later. Um, so the only possibility for the Greens uh, is probably to be, is to be nominated by a government where Greens are, are members, and uh, there are three of them, um, and one of them is probably the most prominent uh, is, uh, is Luxembourg, and then we have Finland and one of the Baltic Republic. So this is the situation as it is, uh, as it is today. But you see, um, beside the question of, uh, of uh, who gets what, I think that we have been fighting from the very beginning because we know that we don't have prime ministers. Um, for uh, um, an alliance or a convergence, which had at the centre the topics, which had at the centre a programme for the European Commission that could lead to, uh, uh, to the topics that I was talking about before, climate change, a change of the uh, model uh, of, uh, uh, of us consuming or doing economy, which a lot of people, including students in the street, call and the urgency of the uh, situation would uh, ask us. So uh, I think that the situation and the game is not over. We will see what happens uh, over, the next, uh, over the next weeks. What I really can say is that the green surge and the green wave cannot just simply be, uh, be ignored. Of course, and I will finish here, the intergovernmental method, meaning um, what Mr. Macron has been also imposing, uh, is something that does not help uh, the possibility of having greens at the top jobs or even green issues because it is simply a question of power game. And if I say, can say one other word on the question mm. of the leading candidate, people had got accustomed of seeing Timmermans, Weber, uh, even Vestager and even Ska and Bas, uh, our candidates, in the debates and in the run. And I think that this is something that also cannot be just simply forgotten. Yeah, that, that, is, a, that is a point, isn't it, uh, Thomas Vitiello? Uh, you, you have a campaign, you see these faces, uh, Europeans start to get to know them, and now they're kind of they're going to go away. Yes, well, I would say, you know, still the European election compared to national election, those candidates are really less known across Europe. Mm. Even if it's true that we see since maybe the previous election already since already 2014, the beginning of like transnationalization of of a campaign. I think we were speaking a lot about uh, the candidate and now the nomination, but we shouldn't forget that there are ongoing negotiations between the four main groups, the Conservative, the Socialists, the Liberal and the Greens, about a common uh, manifesto, common uh, uh, agreement on policy to pursue. And so, you know, I heard what uh, Monica Frassoni said earlier that sure, there is disappointment in the current nomination because uh, I agree with her, you know, the current nomination emphasizes the status quo within the European institutions and the policies implemented. But, you know, the ongoing negotiation where the Greens are participating, maybe there we can expect something a little bit different. Otherwise, it's true that the green wave that we have seen in many European countries uh, might not uh, uh, lead to, uh, to a satisfying outcome for many voters. All right. Uh, change in any case, uh, we, we can expect that the Commission also change at the European Central Bank. And Christine Lagarde, uh, it's a move away from economists who, uh, who uh, do their schooling steeped in monetary policy and more into a party politics kind of profile. Lagarde, a lawyer by training, who first uh, rose the rank, through the ranks of France's conservative uh, uh, party. Shirley Sitbon has more. When asked if she would like to become the European Central Bank's next chief, Christine Lagarde told the Financial Times, no, six times. But that was in September. Now the managing director of the International Monetary Fund for the past eight years is set to take on a new position. 
Throughout her career, Lagarde steered to the top of institutions dominated by men. First as a lawyer, she took the head of U.S. law firm Baker and McKenzie in 1999. The old management methods are fading away. I believe they're part of yesterday's world. I hope that tomorrow's society won't abide by those sexist principles. Six years later, Christine Lagarde became trade minister, agriculture and fishing minister, before Nicolas Sarkozy named her finance minister in 2007, the first woman to hold that job in any of the G8 countries. After France, the world. In 2011, Christine Lagarde took over the helm of the IMF, replacing Dominique Strauss-Kahn, embroiled in sex scandals. Lagarde is regularly ranked as one of the world's 10 most powerful women by Forbes. Executive board. Her only known misstep was during her ministerial years. She was convicted of negligence and failing to contest a state payout of 400 million euros to businessmen Bernard Tapie. Is this a good move, uh, having someone with a more political profile? This is a first for the European Central Bank. She's, uh, she's, again, she's not an economist by training, even if she is at the head of the IMF. She's not an economist, but she has a long experience of being... First, she was uh, France's uh, Minister of Finance during the, the, the crisis, uh, 2008 crisis, and she was, if I remember by Financial Times, considered as the best fi finance minister among the G7 uh, member states at this time. And then she was at the IMF, which is... Uh, uh, also uh, an organization which, which has an economic profile more than uh, also political, but economic. So she, she, she has uh, experience of dealing with very complex uh, issues. And uh, the fact that she's also political, yeah, she was a member and she's still a member of the, of the center-right party in France. She's not exactly from the same party as, uh, as the French president, but again, she's one of those who can be compatible with the, with the centrist uh, party. Uh, There's going to be, at one point or another, during her mandate, uh, a, a, fin a financial crisis of some sort, and at one point or another, there'll probably be a showdown with uh, the board member from Germany, Jens Wiedmann, over monetary policy, over whether uh, to print more money or do more stimulus or not. Yeah, it's, How will she fare at that point? It's difficult to predict, of course. Uh, but at the same time, she's French, but at the same time, being at the head of uh, IMF, she didn't really show... Uh, some kind of, you know, I don't know, leftist policies or in, in terms of uh, laissez-aller, in terms of, uh, of uh, budgetary this issues. Is she was this quite is the tough on, 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 on Greece during the, 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 the financial crisis in Greece or in Argentina, etc. So she can, for the Germans, and they accepted her uh, nomination, she's not the, the, the worst case among the, those that France could propose in this, uh, uh, for this job. Birgit Holzer? Yeah, I think she's going to maybe continue the politics of Mario Draghi. So it's mm. not really who, who already had to deal with Jens Weidmann and the Germans. It's true. They wanted to impose a uh, German at this. Um, they wanted key, to impose Weidmann. Key, yes. Mm. Um, but there are, there are reasons he didn't get there. Um, I think it's important, too, to have somebody um, with a charisma in, in Europe and at um, important places in Europe, because uh, this is one of the problems of Europe. I think that um, we don't really know we know the people who are representing it. So uh, Christine Lagarde is somebody who is with an international standing and a personality. I think it's important. So I think monetary it's policy is going to be crucial. And there's always this accusation that uh, Europe is too German. Uh, is she going to be able to loosen the purse strings if needed? I think that uh, we shouldn't forget that the ECB has become also a political institution with the European debt crisis. Um, it's an institution that always had some policy preferences in terms of structural reforms, in terms of sustain sustainability of national budgets. And uh, with the crisis, it was able to, uh, uh, to insert conditionality uh, to all, the, all its intervention to support Greece, to support Italy, to support other countries. So well, there's a lot of resentment push. over the bailing out of banks. Uh, yeah, it, was, it was a way to, uh, to, to push for structural reform to, you know, to make them, uh, uh, to make, that, make them happen. And so the ECB has become a more political institution. So it's not a surprise that we have a more political profile 
you know, uh, fitting for the job at the moment, knowing that she's not going to be alone, she's going to be surrounded by uh, uh, by uh, uh, other personalities, including the German that we just uh, we just mentioned, but also she will have her own team, so she will not be alone in this process. And so, uh, uh, and then she comes with a legacy of Mario Draghi. So it's not like she's coming out of nowhere. She has experience. She has a political role that fits with the new role of the ECB in the European Union since 10 years. Uh, so, so yeah, I believe she will be able to, to face the situation. Monica Frassoni, your thoughts on the pick of Christine Lagarde? Well, I also feel relatively reassured that uh, she is going probably, I mean, she already said, or it, it, it is to be understood that uh, she will be more in the continuity. Um, we should not forget that uh, Weidman was very often in the minority uh, when he was uh, presenting the positions uh, in the board of the, of the bank. Um, and this is something important that they, we don't have him uh, as ECB president. But I would like to underline two elements. One is that the ECB is moving in a situation in which uh, we are still missing a real banking union. We are a halfway there. And this is something that is negative also for the way in which the ECB can perform its role. And the second element, and so this is a political problem that does not depend from the governor. And the second problem that I see is that uh, uh, if she gets too political, she may lose the extreme credibility among its own, uh, her own or its own uh, um, peers that Mario Draghi enjoyed. He was in, in able also to convince markets, to convince uh, uh, also other central bankers, even the Germans, because he was extremely credible as a personality, as, as a central banker, even if he came, he comes from a country that uh, has got many troubles, as you very well know. Um, so that is probably the element which I consider to be less, uh, I mean, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, what, how she will manage. Yeah, because but, uh, to, to, to reassure, the, to reassure, something that could be worrying. The, to reassure markets, when you have those, those those press conferences, when you're the president of a of a central bank, the job is to read from the script and be as boring as possible. Mm -hmm. Is she going to be able to stay boring? I I really don't know. I just want to say that uh, to really underline the fact that ECB is only half of the story. If we don't complete uh, the banking union with all sorts of uh, uh, balances and possibility of, uh, of a common sharing of, uh, of debts or common sharing of, uh, of liabilities, I think that uh, her job will be uh, very difficult and we, are fa and we could face another financial crisis with the same kind of problems we had in the past. Again, it's, the, it's the, the, what happens during the next crisis. Will they move more towards the banking union? Will we see more Europe or a lot less? It, it depends. Uh, it, it depends on many, uh, uh, many, many aspects. How they again? She, her room for maneuver is quite limited. We have uh, all of us. So we uh, we mentioned that she's uh, pretty much uh, surrounded by 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 people, also by the uh, by the heads of governments in in different countries. And it will depend also on the balance of power between the the, the Germans, the French, the Southern Europeans, Central Europeans, Northern Europeans. So he, she has. She cannot. Uh, uh, lead the, the, the monetary politics uh, again, uh, uh, alone, sorry. Yeah, so the Italians, let's talk about them, because they lose the, uh, the, the presence of the ECB, they lose the uh, foreign policy uh, post, which is going to go to Spain's uh, Josep Borrell. However, they do keep, for now, the gavel uh, at the European Parliament, a 63-year-old former journalist, David Sassoli, who hails from the centre-left. All of you will understand my emotion at this moment in assuming the presidency of the European Parliament, to have been chosen by you to represent the institution that more than any other has a direct link with the citizens, that has the duty to represent them and also to defend them and to always remember, because our freedom is the daughter of justice, that we will have to conquer and we will have to develop solidarity. Toma Vitiello, what's the book on, on, uh, on uh, David Sassoli, who until today most people had never heard of? Yeah, I think of the, the, the reason why Italy didn't get lost uh, the uh, director of uh, ECB and lost uh, Federica Morgherini as uh, uh, one of the top jobs uh, is because well, the current Italian government is quite isolated at the European level. 
Uh, we, we, we look at the Five Star Movement, uh, who struggled to find a partner within the European Parliament of the North League, which obviously, uh, belonging to the extreme right groups, is also rather isolated compared to the, the major group. And so uh, Italy, the Italian government was not in a favorable position in those negotiations. But Italy is an historical member state of the European Union, and, uh, and the Social Democrats did, uh, the Partito Democratico did quite well in the European election. And therefore, uh, at least to give one position, one important position uh, to, uh, to an Italian was also a way to keep Italy as a major member state into this balance of, of power and of uh, top jobs. And what do you think of Sassoli? What can we say about Sassoli? I have to say I have very little knowledge of, of <laughs> the man, uh, as uh, many, uh, uh, many Europeans, I believe. Uh, so I'm sorry, but I would have to... to... Ma Monica Frassoni? Well, first of all, I disagree with the analysis that this is given to Italy or to, I mean, people, we really have to realize that Draghi was not there because he was Italian, was not representing Italy, and the same thing goes for Madame Mogherini, and the same thing goes for uh, Mr. Tajani. Um, on top of it, and, and the same thing goes actually for David Sassoli, in the sense that he was not chosen because he was an Italian, but because, luckily for all of us, I'm sorry not to be particularly, particularly diplomatic, the um, chosen candidate by the council, which uh, was a former prime minister, um, I, the name now escapes me, but his name is Boris, uh, was absolutely not up to the job. And so there was a competition inside the, uh, the, the, socialist, uh, the socialist group, and they chosen uh, David Sassoli. Um, David Sassoli is extremely famous in Italy because he was basically an anchorman in, for many, many years uh, uh, in, uh, in the Italian um, uh, journal televisé, so the, the, the news. Uh, he has been a, a member of parliament for quite some time. He was vice president. He's an extremely convinced European, uh, a man who doesn't like conflict. So, you know, I'm sure that he will be a smooth president. But uh, I really um, would like to insist on the fact that the, that, uh, that the issue of uh, having or not having an isolated government uh, didn't probably play much role in the fact that there is no more an Italian as, as high, com a high representative for foreign policy or as governor of the central bank. Uh, it's, a, it's a rotation and it's normal, it is like that. On top of it, I think that as far as Italy is concerned, they are really pushing for having an important commissioner uh, for competition or, or an economic portfolio. Uh, and there, it will be really up to the parliament and to the hearing to, uh, uh, to make them understand first that the Italian commissioner is not there to represent Italian, uh, uh, Italian interest, even if Mr. Conte, this is what he said, I will send there somebody who can represent Italian, uh, Italian interest, and that uh, they must send somebody who is able to convince the majority of the European parliament. And in the past, this has not been the case, as some of you probably remember. All right, yeah, and, and with the current budget deficit in Italy, we'll, we'll see if they get those posts. But let me ask uh, one final question, Tonica Gordadze. There was a quip in Politico uh, this Wednesday saying that of the, the names we've all mentioned, they're all west of Hanover. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's 28 members in the European Union. Yeah. Uh, just to... And the center of gravity of the European Union moved uh, towards the, the, the east in recent years. I think the central and eastern Europeans can be dissatisfied with, uh, with these uh, uh, nominations for, for different reasons. First, uh, uh, first is that they were hoping for uh, one of the top jobs, for, uh, um, for example, uh, the job for, uh, uh, responsible for foreign policy uh, going to, the, to uh, one of the eastern Europeans. Polish, Lithuanian um, uh, representative, or in the parliament, on the European Parliament. Uh, so they, they are a little bit disappointed. One thing they got is that they, uh, at least the representatives of the Visegrad group, they blocked the um, uh, Timmermans uh, for, 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 the, for the top job. But this is nothing. It's just a, maybe a compensation. That's what the, the uh, Western mm. Europeans can tell them. I think uh, there is this uh, consideration, especially in France, that Eastern Europeans are, are kind of uh, troublemakers. And uh, the France is uh, very much in favor of this historical center of the European, like f founding members should move forward quicker than these Eastern Europeans who are, have different views on different things uh, on Russia. I think the Eastern Europeans will be quite dissatisfied. And I hear already criticism about Joseph Borrell for some reasons, because he was not very actively uh, pro uh, the opposition leader in Venezuela. He's very... 
he's criticizing the United States uh, too much, uh, etc. And he he uh, he praised recently uh, Russia for the uh, for the role in Catalo Catalonian uh, crisis, etc. So they they are already criticizing him. So let's uh, we will see. Uh, uh, what will happen the day when they, then there will be the vote for? Really, because I, I heard the opposite that he was too quick to recognize Juan Guaido. But anyway, that's maybe a, we can have that discussion another time. I want to thank you, Tornika Gordadze. I want to thank uh, Thomas Vitiello, uh, Birgit Holzer. I want to thank as well uh, Monica Frassoni for being with us uh, from Brussels. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to Emma James. Hi there. So he's a famous TV presenter in Italy, but I mispronounced his name earlier. It's, <laughs> how, do you, how, how do you pronounce it? I heard it say Sassoli. Sass or, I'm putting the, the accent on the end, the new president of the European Union. Yes, and what I find interesting as well is the fact that no one seems to be able to decide whether to call him David Sassoli or David Maria Sassoli. And that kind Sassoli. of sums up the fact that nobody really knows who this guy is. Um, outside his, of Italy. <laughs> exactly. Outside of Italy, he is very much unknown. The name is trending everywhere, not just in EU countries, it's interesting to note. It is around the world that his name is trending. Um, but no one seems to know a great deal about him. The European Parliament uh, tweeted um, that he had... Uh, been elected the new president um, and urge people to find out more about him. Um, however, when you click on the link, there really isn't that much more information to be had. There's not even um, a CV, which uh, you would think would be a fairly basic thing. Um, so yes, his no curriculum vitae section on the <laughs> European Parliament there. So I'm not quite sure what they thought we were going to find when we clicked on that link, um, but not a great deal of information about him. Um, it would appear that your guests here are far better informed than pretty much okay. anyone else that I've been reading today. <laughs> Um, lots of angry reactions, and it does seem as though a lot of people just follow the European Parliament just to get annoyed about what they've done. Uh, sorry, who's that, says this gentleman. And then another one says, just another communist, that's great. And this uh, GIF here, clearly somebody uh, not impressed at all with the announcement uh, of this person as president. It won't play for some reason, which is unfortunate. Um, this is another angry uh, remark that we're seeing a great deal of. That was definitely not an election. It's a Franco-German arrangement. Um, looking elsewhere, though, at who exactly this guy is, because it is something of a... Well, mystery to many. Uh, Politico don't seem to have that much more information, it has to be said. Um, they do talk about the fact he's a former TV journalist, uh, known in Italy but not beyond, and that he's a socialist. And the only other thing they really add to this is just how unexpected it was for him to be even in the running. Um, apparently, this decision to run was only made public on Tuesday at the end of the parliamentary session, so less than two days before he then gets given the, the position. So it does seem quite an interesting one. Um, the local has a little bit more information, uh, the Italian version of the local, um, saying that he entered into politics 10 years ago, he's 63 years old, father of two, studied political science um, and was an anchor on Rai, the national uh, TV broadcaster. But politically, again, there's still not that much information mm. out there. Um, and on the European Parliament website as well, not too much about his political history. Some people saying that means he didn't really do anything in those 10 years. We, li we live in an age where we expect to have Everybody's digital footprint be Absolutely, huge. absolutely. I think it is an expectation that we have now that we can just click on two things and find out everything about a person. Right. And, and with this gentleman, it just isn't the case. And it is quite interesting to see that. Um, he has tweeted, uh, probably the only thing that will give you a, a, an idea of the man, if you like, he's tweeted uh, that many people have written about his election uh, being about redeeming the honour of Italy. He says, but the honour of Italy will never depend on a single person. It depends on the fact that we are a great, extraordinary country. And that kind of chimes in, really, with what he was saying um, in his first speech as president, that basically the EU must all work together. That's when it works, when people work together, when institutions work together. Um, and just a final word on this, though. His inaugural speech wasn't attended by everyone. As this Lib Dem MEP points out, uh, the Brexit party were not there. After their shenanigans yesterday turning the backs on uh, the European anthem, uh, they did not even bother to see their, their president sworn in. But this gentleman claims they did turn up so that they could get their daily allowance. That's right, because they've changed the rules now. You have to show up if you want to... Exactly. But you can show up and then go home, apparently. Oh, dear. Many thanks uh, for that, Emma James. I want to thank the rest of our panel. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.